thank you everyone for joining uh, the Impact Investor Panel at Digital Resi. Um, the panel is moderated by Andy Merkin of Burns and & Levinson, and the other panelists are Rick Lipkin of the Catholic Catalytic Impact Foundation, John Parker of Spring Hood Ventures, and Brian Meshkin of both Profound Ventures and the Cancer Fund. So with that, I will let Andy lead the discussion. All right, thank you, Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody continues to be safe and healthy. And for those of us uh, in the midst of a very early summer uh, are enjoying some uh, hot and sticky weather. Uh, as Karen said, my name is Andy Merkin. I'm a partner at uh, in the business law group at the Boston-based law firm Burns and Levinson, uh, where I'm co-chair of the life sciences practice, and I also co-chair of the securities practice. I'd like to thank Resi and Life Science Nation for asking me to moderate today's panel. Uh, I've been as a longtime Resi participant and sponsor. I think this is my 15th or 16th conference, uh, both in person and digitally. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Uh, I'm also excited to be moderating this particular panel on impact investing. Um, as I've represented both sides of investment and funding transactions involving impact investors, both companies in receiving and impact investors in making uh, investments and research grants. Happy to connect with anyone offline and share with you my experience. Uh, I've met a number of companies through Resi who told me that they really are looking to better understand impact investing and get some visibility with impact investors. So I hope that today's panel is one step in that process. With this in mind, Life Science Nation and the Resi Conference have pulled together an outstanding group of representatives of impact investors to share with you their thoughts on what entrepreneurs and early stage companies need to know when considering investments from impact investors. Please feel free to submit any questions through the chat feature uh, and we will do our best to have them all answered. Uh, with that, why don't we um, jump right in. Um, and what I'd like to do first is ask uh, each of our three panelists to uh, introduce yourselves, give us a little bit of your background, how you got to where you are today, and, and a high-level overview of, uh, of the fund or the firm. We will drill down a little bit uh, in the next hour into the specifics of how and why on the investing front, but just to give people a sense for who, uh, you know, who they're listening to today. So maybe uh, Rick, maybe you want to jump in first on that? Sure. Thank you, Andy. So my name is Rick Lipkin, and I am both a managing director of Easton Capital Investment Group in New York City, and also a co-founder, along with a team, my colleague Rachel Butler and others, of the Catalytic Impact Foundation, which is dedicated to impact investing in the life sciences and health healthcare sector. So um, I, my pathway into this is started early in life with a passion in science and early on an intention to go into basic science research. Uh, as my life evolved, I became uh, more interested and understood better the opportunities outside of that and began to explore my own interest in, uh, in, in the emerging world of these wonderful companies. So I uh, have been for a long time now involved in the early and mid-stage life sciences healthcare space. I've been involved with Easton Capital for more than a decade. In the case of the Catalytic Impact Foundation, we created it uh, in the 2015-2016 timeframe. And we are incredibly proud of the work that we've done as a team and as a community. Uh, I guess uh, we'll get into the details of all that uh, to follow. Great, thanks. But Rick, just but the, the, your two your two organizations they're on they're non affiliated, correct? They're two completely separate. unrelated. Okay. They do similar kinds of work, but the Catalytic Impact Foundation is the dedicated entity for impact investing in life sciences and healthcare. Got it. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's very helpful. Brian, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Andy. It's an honor to be a part of this distinguished panel and. Thanks, uh, Rick, for sharing kind of your why and how you got involved in this. Uh, I, too, have enjoyed participating with Resi over the years as well. Uh, I've been a social entrepreneur and innovator and impact investor, honestly, since I was a teenager, so like for over 30 years. Uh, back when I was just 13 years old, uh, a friend of mine actually was hit by a car and killed in front of my home. 
And following that awful tragedy, being one of the first people there on the scene, I led an effort to lobby for and enact the nation's first bicycle helmet law for children. And then I helped start a nonprofit. Uh, at the time, it was called the National Safe Kids Campaign, which today is called Safe Kids Worldwide, as we advocated for and helped over uh, 300 different jurisdictions across the United States enact similar laws uh, to protect kids. It was the Safe Kids Campaign's first initiative. And because of those efforts, when you think about social impact, uh, a 30 year trend of fatality rates for kids was dramatically cut by over 90% and has remained low over the past 30 years since, which has saved over 10,000 children's lives and many thousands more head injuries. From there, I, I realized that someone like me who wasn't particularly special could actually make a positive impact in the world. And um, it really kind of set me on a course to try to make the world a better place. And so I spent my career as an innovator, an entrepreneur, and an investor. I've, I've worked in innovation within large pharma at Eli Lilly and Johnson & Johnson, two great companies. Uh, helped grow some really fast growing small growth companies into acquisitions like Prometheus Labs. And I've even founded and served as CEO of some of the fastest growing health technology companies in North America on the Inc. 500, et cetera. Uh, currently, I'm the managing partner of Profound Ventures, which is a Southern California-based social impact investment group that I founded back in 2017. And we have a portfolio of 12 companies that are working to solve profound societal problems in healthcare. Uh, we're small check writers, um, but we are able to help our companies hit their next inflection points. And we've raised over $50 million in, in follow-on financing just in 2020 alone into our portfolio. Uh, I'm also a new venture partner with a new fund called Cancer Fund based in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a $30 million social impact fund, but micro fund at 30 million, where we invest in companies to help cancer patients and their families. Uh, I also have a consulting business called Stratus Advisors to help these entrepreneurs build their rocket ships. Um, and I'm excited for our discussion today and to learn from others. Oh, no, thanks, Brian. That's, I mean, very, uh, horrific, but interesting story about how everything started with the accident years ago. Um, but I could also I could also tell you you must sleep about two or three hours a night given all that you're doing. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, last and so not least, John Parker. What you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, um, yeah. I wish I could say I'd been doing this as long as Brian. I mean, that's a <laughs> great journey. Um, so I uh, I actually spend most of my uh, my career just in and around the investment space, generally speaking, like you know, like so many folks trying to just get good returns and make money, but mostly in the uh, the alternative space of venture private equity, some time in hedge funds. I came to what I'm doing now um, uh, through a foundation in Boston here called the Charles Hood Foundation. So I've been a trustee of that foundation now for uh, 13 years or so. And back um, uh, six or seven years ago, we decided for a, a number of reasons, I, I won't go into all the details, but we decided to set up an early stage venture fund um, around our mission of children's health. Uh, it, it, it's been a fantastic journey. We, we do early stage investing uh, uh, across lots of sectors and indications, but we've now got a portfolio of a dozen companies uh, and uh, just, just doing some fantastic things. That effort uh, uh, sort of took over my life. And now in addition to the portfolio that I run for the foundation is sort of a single uh, LP fund. Uh, I also run a more traditional uh, fund around the same mission, but separate from, from the foundation. Uh, that's just very much a mission-based fund around children's health, but more return-driven. So it's uh, it, that's a little more double bottom line versus the other one, which is uh, impact first. So, um, you know, happy to dig in on the details as we go along here, but it's, it's just, uh, for me, it's personally been uh, such a privilege to find myself in this, uh, at this point in life where I can invest, um, but do it in such cool technology and around such an important mission. So, no, thank you, John. That's, I, I, I kicked this off by telling the audience, we had a really outstanding panel and, um, I'll, I'll second my own notion there. Really, I'm looking forward to this. So, um, let's, let's take a half a step back before we drill down a little more deeply into sort of the mechanics and some of the things that you're doing. And, and, set a baseline for the panel and, and, and let's answer the question of what exactly is meant by impact investing. Um, so if I could throw that question out, what is impact investing? And broadly speaking, how does it differ from your more traditional financial or strategic VC investing? Um, I'll pick up. Um, so when I'm thinking about uh, this, uh, you know, and, and again, with the, the two hats I wear at the different funds, in both cases, we think about this really as investing for outcomes. Um, economics uh, can be a, a big part of it uh, one way or another. I've got one group where we might uh, uh, take on a little more risk or have a concessionary element 
uh, another where returns are absolutely going to be front and center. But either way, the driving motivation when we're screening, selecting, and then even managing investments going on is how are we going to get to the point where we are improving the lives of kids? Uh, and so that uh, influences every decision we make. And so it is impact sort of from the ground up from that perspective, but all the way through to, you know, how do we measure our success around that? Uh, and it is not something we do instead of seeking returns in most cases, but alongside that effort. Great, that, that's very helpful. Um, Rick or Brian, do you wanna add anything to, uh, to that description? Sure, I'd love to. I, I think that I think uh, John did a great job in kind of laying things out. I think the big difference really comes out of the quantification of what return is on the investment. Uh, you know, as impact investors, I think we we elevate and prioritize what the social impact or the impact on people's lives are when it comes to uh, when it comes to impact investing. I think generally we're looking for a positive impact, <laughs> not a negative impact. And so beyond the financial metrics. Uh, I think there's some, there are probably some folks that are out there that are more on the foundation nonprofit side that may ignore some of the financial metrics and just purely look at it as like a grant um, and purely just the social impact. But I think impact investing means that they go hand in hand. Uh, and I think that that's important. Um, and, and I think that this is a notion that's being thrown out there a lot. And, and I've had several people approach me about it. So actually, um, next week, I'm actually going to launch a podcast. Um, in a clubhouse room that I'm calling Heart Investors, basically, which will feature interviews with folks like you guys. Um, the, you know, we've all heard the cliche of smart money in investors, people who are familiar with an industry, a product or problem based on their background. You know, they know in their head and they can bring value because of what they know. What I call heart investing are really investors who know in their heart. They know about an industry, a product or problem by virtue of personal experience, a professional challenge, something that happened in their family, or something in their life story inspires them to want to help solve the problem or contribute to the field in some way. You know, they not only know, but they care. And I think that's really kind of the big difference with, with social impact investing. So the, the invitation goes out to all you guys. I've mean, I got a bunch of people already lined up, but I'd love to <laughs> consider being interviewed uh, on the podcast and talk a little bit about your story, because I think it will not only inspire people, but hopefully Hopefully educate people and make them feel more comfortable with the idea of impact investing or working with funds like ours, um, because I think that we can solve a lot of problems in the world by motivating people both what they know in their head and in their heart. So, so Rick, I'd love, love to hear your thoughts, but Brian, just to ask um, sort of one follow-up question for that, an interesting point. So you said, so you would put make impact investing a, a different category than use the example of, of foundations and nonprofits. Uh, which you know may be return agnostic essentially, um, but you're saying you, you know you're doing some sort of combination, but it, it's different than those. Because and I ask in part also because um, we had done through the Resi conference back in January um, a panel on family offices, and that's what I was going to say. It's very similar to a family office dynamic, right? Okay, and, but and because the interesting point there was that um, about you know half of the half we had I think four family offices. Uh, you know, and, and they really ran, ran the gamut. One was a traditional family office, meaning the money's, you know, it's single LP money is coming from a family, but it was pure traditional venture investing. They didn't care about, you know, they obviously cared about, they wanted to care about the return first, all the way to the other end of, uh, you know, look, we're, we're here because the family's experienced a particular medical issue. Exactly. What we want to do is just advance the science. We're not looking for a return. So you're, I'm interested in how you're, you're comparing yourself to that. Well, I, th I think that um, we've had a lot of traction actually with family offices participating and co-investing with us. Ah, okay. I think I think family offices, just by virtue of the nature of how they're constructed, there are priorities that come from the family's life story, whatever that is, something that, that is a hereditary disease in the family or something that happened to one of the parents or a child or whatever it may be. And that becomes a priority. And we've seen family offices grown immensely in, in importance when you think of your capital raising strategy and where they fit in. And so I think that the trend of paying attention to impact investing, that the elevation of importance of family offices go hand in hand. And I think it's synergistic. Terrific. No, thank you very much. Rick, anything to, to add to our high level question of what, what is impact sure. investing? Honestly, from my perspective and the perspective of the Catalytic Impact Foundation, it's all about making a difference in the world. And, you know, that's really what impact investing is all about. 
In our case, we're focusing very specifically on unmet healthcare needs, notably in certain areas like children's health, women's health, brain health, aging, rare diseases. But um, so we have a particular way of filtering what we do. Um, but we're, uh, we absolutely pay attention to financial return as well as, uh, as well as impact. We feel we need, to, we need to generate both. It's part of our business model. And uh, we are a philanthropic organization, but we want to run a disciplined ship. And our goal is to bring to this process the, uh, the, the, the best tools, practices, and wisdom of, of traditional high-tier VC. And yet it's a philanthropic organization. So we really are aiming for both. And we have certain, in fact, we, we, we practice what we call uh, uh, regenerative philanthropy or impact in perpetuity. Huh. The goal being that we want to invest in companies that not only make a tremendous difference in the world and measurably so, which we do measure, but also will produce a financial return. So the money goes back into our fund and we're putting it out there again for more impact. No, th thank you. That's that's terrific. And actually, maybe, can I interrupt? I'm going to at the yeah, risk yeah. of derailing the conversation, but you oh, you please. had encouraged discussion earlier. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, one of the things, picking up both on Rick and Brian's comments, that it has uh, really evolved for us is this uh, this concept. We're we're rooted in philanthropy. This started from a foundation. We make a lot of grants. We do things, but we saw that. Too, too much good science was not reaching the patients that we were trying to help. Um, and uh, you know, just lack of funding, lack of follow through, other priorities, whatever, but there was, there was a big gap there. And as we started to think through how we are going to run an investment program in this area, we decided, we, we concluded very early that the economics are gonna have to work around these things. They, it is very hard to make real financial concessions and still reach patients sustainably and at scale. If you wanna to get to those patients and really help them, the economics are gonna to have to work around the investment. So our concession, we will take risk-based concessions where we will maybe go in earlier than some other investors might. Um, uh, we'll help maybe get some, uh, generate some evidence and different things, but we're not looking for a low return Thing ever because those it's just very hard to ever get those things out into the marketplace so they're helping actual children so when we think about this it's it is always the we the lens always has to come back to how are the economics going to work in a way that return that that reward the investors who are going to fund this thing because if you can't bring investors in and this is something with children's health very specifically I mean, you know people think of philanthropy when they think of children's health and we are trying to change that discussion. So you have to understand that there, we, you know, both for companies and other investors, we're going to find that formula that can get this solution to kids and people are gonna make money. You're gonna do all, all of these different things, but we sort of fight through that and try to figure out where we can do that. So it's been a really interesting journey for us on that path, but returns are always gonna to have to be there. And actually that, that let me, let me um, ask sort of follow up on one piece of that, John. And I absolutely, I said, you know, jump in, ask questions, make at any time. It uh, makes a much more interesting panel than listening to me ask questions. Um, but maybe all three of you could also talk a little bit about your, your own and, you know, your own investors. So are they, are they traditional, either, you know, institutional or even if they're individuals, families, but they're financial investors who happen to like this particular cause, call it, uh, or, or are they, you know, not, they're, they themselves looking not necessarily for that return, John, I think I have a sense based on what you just said, but they're more interested in, again, the cause of the events and the science. So give us a sense for the types of investors that you have in, in the funds. And also, you know, is it, are they all traditional funds or are they organized a little bit differently? Um, so, so for me, I'll, ju I'll jump in the, um, you know, we, look, I've got the foundation piece. That's a, a it's a private foundation. Um, you know, we, we use, uh, for folks who are familiar with it, the program related investment tool there. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a, an LLC set up called CH Innovations. It, it's, there's nothing too complicated about that. The other fund, traditional limited partnership. For investors coming into that, Look, nobody's going to do what I do if you're if you don't have an interest in children's health. It's just it, it 
from my experience, that doesn't happen. Nobody's going to say, um, I don't care about children, but boy, that's a great place to make money. Um, <laughs> that's, re that's reality. Um, uh, so to, to get to open that door and, uh, and start having those conversations where I can share the story around the, the return po po possibilities, the overlooked opportunity, uh, there some, you know, some unique market characteristics, all of that. I need folks who are going to have an interest in that space. So that could be family offices, foundations, high net worth individuals. Um, there are some institutions that have an interest in that space. So again, it, that opens the door of the conversation. Um, I'm still going to convince them or work to convince them that there is a strong return story there too. Um, but it's not going to, probably not going to fit the big pension fund that's checking the boxes on their fiduciary duty. It's not going to work with big and, uh, you know, traditional institutional investment consultants. It's, it doesn't fit neatly into the boxes and that's fine. There's, there's plenty of room to play out there in the marketplace right now. Terrific. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to just want to add to that or, or maybe. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that with Profound and with Cancer Fund, we do it a little bit differently. So with Cancer Fund, it's kind of interesting because we've mobilized thousands of people who have traditionally contributed to nonprofits for the purposes of hoping that that money would go to research that would result in discoveries to ultimately help patients. And I think John made some really good points about at the end of the day, you know, there are a lot of good ideas out there, but good ideas are like rear ends. Everybody's got them. It really comes down to implementation. And, and so you need to know how you're ultimately going to implement this. Cause if it's not financially viable, um, it's never going to benefit patients. Um, and, and so you need to come up with an implementation pathway so that, you know, you can actually make it available for doctors to prescribe or use to help patients, whatever it is. And, and so to that end, what attracts investors to cancer fund, and we had literally, I mean, we literally got a check from someone that heard about our fund and sent a personal check with your chicken scratch cursive writing on it to participate in the fund in a very small amount, but the, the emotionally beautiful thing about the experience was in the memo line, he wrote a little note that it was in memory of this particular loved one who had died from cancer. And to me, that embodies what impact investing was all about. Is it because it was about a person, about a story, about something that happened in this experience that we all share in called mortality that, that inspired this person to say, hey, I want to do something. And so instead of maybe giving it to this particular society or this particular society, and a portion of that money may go to research, they trust an investment group that has a very small overhead with a management fee that's tiny um, compared to the administrative fee, um, in a, a, a nonprofit and says, yeah, I want this to go to early stage research for cancer. And so that's cancer funds model, which I think is really compelling and exciting with profound. We take a different approach. Uh, we're small check writers and it's, it's our own money ourselves amongst the partners. And then what we do is we try to bring together high net worth individuals and organizations that we think have a vested interest in understanding what the problem is and can have that aha moment to say, yeah, I want to be a part of the solution. Because one of the things I learned back when I was a teenager and we did the bicycle helmet laws is, you know, we passed over 300 laws all across the United States while I was in high school, but the laws worked in some places and they didn't work in others. And so I volunteered with the school of public health at Johns Hopkins, spoke at a bunch of different conferences. We did research to find out why, because we all know laws really don't solve any problems, but what made the problems be solved in certain areas was a combination of public health, public education, aligning industry, working with parent groups, uh, getting things in the curriculum in schools, et cetera, et cetera. And so you had to align the stakeholders. And so with Profound, we're really interested in solving problems, not just a technology, not just a company, but really solving the problem. And so sometimes that means that you need to mobilize the people who have a vested interest in the problem right now, who are making money on the problem right now, because if they're not bought into the scaffolding that's going to get you from point A to point B to the solution, they're going to be friction and they're going to be obstacles. And so we've done that in bringing together on a particular venture, neurosurgeons who were involved in another particular venture, other folks who were who would be involved in the, uh, in the problem and the solution to co-invest with us as high net worth individuals, accredited investors, those type of things. Very interesting. 
Yeah, let me add to that because um, structurally, CIF is similar to what you guys are doing, but it's a little different. So let me take you to the origin story for a minute. And it begins with, you know, doing classical life sciences, healthcare venture capital, and seeing all sorts of worthy companies come along that, you know, you have an amazing team coming out of, you know, Harvard Medical School, Stanford, Columbia, whatever. And they a team of amazing people that have spent maybe, you know, 20 years developing a molecule and that molecule actually could cure or treat a rare childhood illness. And, you know, there would be a bunch of venture capitalists sitting around. They'd say, how many, how many kids suffer from this? And they'd say, well, you know, there's maybe 2000 a year who suffer and maybe there are 12,000 still alive in the United States, but they die when they're relatively young. And everybody, you know, the, the, traditional investors would sort of lose interest. And it got me really angry. I felt like this is outrageous. There are children dying and we've got solutions and there's no decent economic model to actually treat these kids. And it, it got me to thinking. And I said, there's gotta be a solution to this. So, you know, I and a few of us sort of hatched this idea for the Catalytic Impact Foundation, which is itself a philanthropic organization. Money is donated to us. And we have a partnership with a, uh, a donor advised fund platforms actually called impact assets. And we partner with them, we pool our money and we run this, we hope with the discipline of real VC, but we are aiming for something larger and higher. And all of the money that comes in is, is pooled. We have about 30, uh, 30 plus companies in our portfolio right now. We're starting to get exits already. The money goes back into the pool again for reinvestment. It's an evergreen structure. Uh, and, and our vision is to build a real permanent lasting foundation, something, you know, I, I aspire to certain of the, the you know, the, the, the great foundations of this country that have all sorts of social missions. This one, the CIF, as we're acronym, will be dedicated to in, uh, innovation in life sciences and healthcare, addressing unmet healthcare need ongoingly and in perpetuity. You know, I look, I, I can envision, you know, having a, a, a permanent billion dollar endowment that will go on. And, you know, we started this organization four or five years ago, as I say, we've been growing, we've had, we built an incredible community now. We actually have 60 to 70 people across the United States and Europe who are high level professionals, really amazing people. People who've launched, built and sold companies, pharmaceutical executives, uh, hedge fund managers, venture managers, private equity people, um, uh, doctors, scientists, family offices, disease organizations, a big community now. And everybody in it has the same goal in mind. We're going to innovate at a high level and we're gonna do it differently. And, um, you know, it's, it's an irony, actually. Some of the people that I, that I were working with and collaborating with in our syndicates, I couldn't buy their time. And yet, because of what we're doing, they're, they'll donate it for free and we'll work together. And it's a remarkable, it's been a remarkable experience for me. So anyway, that's the idea is virtual entity, very lightweight, like, like what Brian and John are talking about, but assets going into companies a, a, a delivering translation and making measurable impact and differences, which we record and distribute to our donors. Right, and and <clears throat> the key thing being there that they are donors as opposed to investors, as you said, it's all donations that are coming in. So that's how you maintain the evergreen. And it does make a difference. It really does because we don't have to worry about answering to investors. We don't. We we do answer to our donors very right. much so, but we we're taking the real long view. And not an undisciplined long view, as in we'll just throw money at something and, you know, it's, it's more like this is skilled shepherding of companies with the long view in mind. Got it. Terrific. I think that's awesome, Rick. Uh, can we, so let, let's talk a little bit more about sort of the process and the mechanics so that uh, those attendees here who might be looking for funding, um, be looking to one of you as a potential source uh, you know, can get a, a little better sense of how things work out there. So maybe could you tell me how, how you source investments? How are you finding opportunities? And is it different than the way that a traditional 
um, again, a financial or a strategic VC would would do the same, would find their opportunities. I, I, I'll take that one. So the the answer is um, kind of yes and kind of no. So we <laughs> come. Everybody in my community comes to this with 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 as a professional investor. We're not coming to the you know to this in in a, in a, in, a, in a different way, but we we hunt. You know. Um, there are thousands and thousands of worthy meritorious companies that come at us all the time. We attend great conferences such as RESI and other ones like RESI, but we're very proactive. One of the problems we have, I would say, is filtering. Is just how do you filter this? I mean, I have, you know, I, I interact with more than a thousand companies a year, sometimes more than a hundred a week. It's and it's 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 very hard to to filter properly. But uh, we have a whole community doing that. So the answer is we're proactive. We put word out to our partners and we hunt. We want to go find what we want, not just be passive and let it come to us. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Rick. It's, it's the same for us, both at Cancer Fund as well as with Profound um, there, there is a huge amount of opportunities out there, and whether it's great conferences like Resi, just people unbound and solicited, being a part of syndicates we've invested in beforehand, and we get referrals from people who are maybe further downstream or earlier than us, etc. Um, you know, sometimes we're the little the metaphor I use is sometimes we're the little high chair at the table with people that occupy much bigger chairs, um, and then sometimes we're in a situation where they've collared money and they need someone to lead and unlock that money who's willing to invest in the due diligence and those type of things because we have the infrastructure to do it. Um, I, I love Rick's passion around some like these lost causes that may get lost by the traditional investors. Because um, I think as we start to understand, for those of us that are in healthcare, as we start to understand some of these diseases, it really is a bunch of orphan diseases that all get labeled into one big disease if we ultimately understand them better. And, um, and so at Cancer Fund, you know, we, we look at that all the time. We have our, one of our first investments was in a, a therapeutics platform in glioblastoma to start with. Um, an epigenetics play. Big pharma doesn't want to touch glioblastoma right now. They're not interested in it. So the typical VCs aren't investing in it at the moment. Um, they'd rather be in breast, lung, uh, pro you know, one of the bigger uh, prevalence cancers. Um, but when you look at people who are searching for answers and have failed therapies and the opportunities, let's say with AI, the opportunities, a lot of things, it's in some of these lost cause type situations that maybe have a smaller incidence. And so I think social impact investors can help there, help where maybe the return isn't quantified as big as it needs to be for some of the traditional folks, where you know you may be in like a valley of death as a company and, and how to fit in there. And an impact investor can be the white, you know, the white knight in, you know, and, and shining armor, whatever the cliche is, and be able to come in and, and help you get to that point. Um, and I, I, I think that there's plenty of opportunities out there. The, the difficulty we find is being able to ultimately sift through and make the decision as to which ones you want to work with and which ones you don't want to, because there are so many good opportunities out there. There's great technology, great entrepreneurs, um, and it's just a function of there's only 24 hours in a day. So actually, so I'd like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about the diligence and, and deal process, but. Um, maybe, maybe I, I, Brian, you're raising the interesting point. Can you all give me, maybe give us a sense for how many, you know, potential opportunities are coming to you in a, in a year, uh, you know, sort of, and what percentage of those do you pass on versus say, let's at least take a deeper dive into, and then ultimately what number might you invest in just to give us a, an understanding of that. Okay. Well, I'll go first on that one since I don't think I've gone first yet. I mean, thousands. <laughs> A year, um, I don't. I haven't quantified how many thousands, but thousands a year um, will approach. Um, we'll try to respond to each of the inquiries in some form or fashion, just out of courtesy, just to be kind to people. Um, even if it's you know, sorry, but it doesn't really fit in what we're looking at right now. Um, and and then you know, out of the hundreds uh, that we will have extensive conversations with. Uh, we'll invest in just a few. So with Profound, we have uh, equity position in 12 companies. Um, and but over four years, almost, we've seen thousands. Uh, with Cancer Fund, 
Uh, we have a bunch in our pipeline right now. Uh, we've invested in one so far. We'll probably do a half dozen investments uh, this year. Um, and in fund one, you know, there'll probably be a couple dozen investments that we may make um, out of fund one over the next two years. And so there is a there is a funnel that happens, and I'm sure it's probably similar for everybody. Yeah, we similar with it's a funnel, and uh, I I admire Brian for trying to at least make an effort to get back to every company that reaches out to him. In our case, I'm actually embarrassed by the fact that so many companies are coming at us, and it's it's just impossible to to treat them with the respect that they deserve. <laughs> and I always feel like. Don't want them to feel neglected, but uh, it's it's literally drinking from a fire hose. Um, but that said, to be specific, with you know several thousand companies coming at us, say per year, um, we probably interact seriously with about a hundred a year. I would say, meaning we, roughly speaking, um, you know, let's say you've got a thousand companies that come at you, maybe a hundred get to a first meeting of that first meeting, maybe 50 get to a second meeting, of the 50, maybe um, you know, 20 get to a third meeting. And then of those, we probably do 10 to 12 companies per year. Because that's a, we've been investing actively for about a little over three years. We've got about 33 companies now and probably end up this year with about 40. Uh, so that's the, and, but we also, we also build. We start out with, we wanna get to know companies. And we sometimes we act relatively quickly and something can happen in a few weeks. Sometimes we get to know them over time. And we've actually known management teams for two years as their company ripens and gets ready for investment. And then we will enter with a small amount of money and then add to the position over time. We are called catalytic impact foundation. We highlight that word catalytic. We want to catalyze. We'll, we might even put in as little as $100,000 into an early stage company, but try to you know, rally, rally the troops and maybe get a million. And it's not uncommon for a million dollars to follow us uh, if, we, you know, if we're with a company. So that's the framework. Yeah, I, I probably don't have a lot of, of new material to add to um, uh, what Ray and Brian said there, but it was an interesting journey for us. because So when, when I first started doing this, um, you know, investing in children's health. I, we didn't see other people doing this and everything. And well, though we, we had folks in our backyard, we could talk to at the children's hospitals and researchers we knew, um, we started to build this pipeline. Um, and so early on, it, it was not that strong. Um, then word gets out and you start getting active. And now, yes, we have the fire hose problem. Um, yeah, there, and it's, it's probably not as big as, um, what Rick and Brian are saying, I mean, we are focused on children's health, and I don't really include uh, those folks who do get in touch and say, oh, we can do something in children's health too. What do you want us to do? Uh, it, they, I sort of ignore that. Um, but, you know, we're getting, I don't know, somewhere between at this point 250 and 500 a year in there, of which, you know, we're going to do one, two, or three of them a year. You know, it's uh you know, it's uh, the odds aren't better than uh, one in a hundred and getting worse as time goes on. Um, but we still try. And look, I, I spend a lot of effort trying to respond to as many as I can. I want to know what's going on in the child health space. It's important for me to uh, to know what people are up to, know what, what folks are working on, um, and to not only, again, I, I get myself in trouble here, but um, I want to be helpful even where I can't invest. I, there, I, I can't invest in most of them. And there are a lot of really good companies out there. So whether it's you know, me introducing them to you know, my colleagues here or, or done, you know, tons of other folks, uh, getting them in front of uh, very specific investors around uh, uh, one indication, uh, you know, whether it's in the cancer space or a rare disease organization where folks might be investing. Um, you know, it, it does uh, chew into the hours in the day, but it's important to be, be helping. And again, that's, I think that's part of the mission there is, you know, is understanding what's going on. And sometimes those things come around. I, I, we're, I'm not always the fastest investor too. Um, it often takes 
nine, 12, 18 months before that check comes as we get comfort with people. So it takes a while. We nurture things. We'll talk to a number of companies on an ongoing basis for a long period of time. Ultimately, we may invest, um, but it is a long process. But yeah, if, I, if, I, if I can jump in, just add a little bit more, um, because I, I think both John and Rick bring up some really good points there. I mean, one of the things that we started at Profound, and we also do it at Cancer Fund, we call it just a venture studio. Um, and we find that there are companies that will reach out to us that for one reason or another, we don't think they're ready for the money that they want. <laughs> um, and, and so what we will do, and this is also a balancing act because it takes time, um, but unlike John, who has like that extensive investment experience, you know, having done all his career, I've been more the operator. So like, if you were like thinking of a typical role in a private equity group, I'd be like the operating partner, um, <laughs> because I'm more the guy who's been the CEO in, in that type of thing. And so my inclination is always to figure out how I can roll up my sleeves and help these guys get to where they need to get to. And let's put this and let's tweak this and et cetera, et cetera. And so we've done situations where we have either had in-kind services along with the side, the money, those type of things to help these companies get to where they need to get to so that we can then have the follow-on investors like Rick was talking about, that he can, you know, have a hundred thousand and more money come in or John, you know, have the goodness of his heart talking about how he wants to introduce people or help them. We'll I, I've jumped in in a CXO type role interim basis to fix what needs to be fixed and then bring on several million dollars afterwards type thing just to help them do it. Um, because I mean, time and money are the two things that everybody wants more of and never has enough of, right? Um, and so if we can give them some time um, and help them uh, evolve and mature like Rick was talking about to get them ready, we'll, we'll try to do that uh, on, on a very limited kind of strategic basis. Let, let me add too about the importance of collaboration because you know, in, in our case, CIF, we have a large mandate, which is unmet healthcare need in general. And we, have, we focus on children's health, women's health, brain health, aging, rare diseases, infectious diseases. And I say this because we can't do everything ourselves and don't want to. Like John and Brian, we really come to this with a spirit of wanting to help companies. But um, we, we're, we build community. And in fact, you know, uh, we love to collaborate with folks like John, with folks like Brian. John is part of our community. In fact, John and I have known each other for many years, and John is fabulous in the area of children's health. And we talk about companies all the time and share ideas and, and send companies back and forth. And uh, that's part of how we function. And I think it's everybody needs to know that uh, it takes a village, so to speak, <laughs> that it really does. The old days of, 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 just you know, one venture firm carrying a company forever—it just doesn't work that way anymore. Um, it's a little different when you know it's a multi-billion-dollar entity that goes in with a Series A of 50, 50 million dollars. It's a different story, but even they build build syndicates now. And um, but this syndication, collaboration, cooperation—you know—a process is really critical to getting good results. Um, we don't feel like we have to be the smartest people at the table or the best people at the table. Our goal is to have the best team around a company so it will win and ultimately make a difference in the world. Now that, I mean, oh, that is so critical. Um, this is in, in uh, yeah, th thanks for mentioning uh, yeah, our chances to work together, Rick, because it's uh, it, it, what we've been able to do with some of the, the investments we've worked on together. And I've seen this with other things that I've worked on. If you can, bring an investor group together that is highly engaged, but brings a variety of different skill sets to the table, you're going to exponentially increase your chances of success. So I, I, I love to be able to team up with perhaps a, a, a disease focused investor in that particular area. And I can bring some of that perspective around uh, bringing a pediatric solution to market, getting through the regulatory process. Who do you talk to there? But then uh, with another group that may have some expertise around the science with a particular, with, with that one indication that they're going after, even if it's just one of the, the things in their pipeline, um, or to tap into, you know, uh, like Rick's expertise where, hey, you've got the pediatric thing, but we've also got some specialties around maybe longevity, and we, we want to be able to talk to you about how that's going to apply there. 
Um, but if you've got this group of investors who are really thinking about solving the problem, getting to the patient, you, you give yourself a leg up versus, I, I, not to say that most investors are like this, but there are those who are out there who, yeah, they're, they're going to invest, they're going to look for return. If it's not working, they're going to want you to kill it and they're not going to do anything else with it and try to move it forward. Um, uh, so we, we just, we, it's so fantastic to be able to work with folks who have that same kind of passion to move things, meaningful solutions forward. No, that, and I, I agree with every, you know, everything you've been saying, and it really has it, it in my years working in this space, it's, it's really changed dramatically, all for the better, you know, in terms of the collaboration that you're talking about, in part because I think more, you know, higher numbers are needed in terms of, you know, investments and resources and just the science and the world has gotten a lot more complicated that it, it, re it really does take a village, which from a personal perspective, one of the reasons that I really like working in this space versus, uh, you know, straight tech or things like that. Um, it's because it really is a, a very collaborative, as you all use the word collaborative community. Um, can I uh, talk to you a little bit more about process? So if I could ask, um, how does the fact that you are impact investors um, change, if at all, um, the process? So it, I'm sort of focusing primarily on the due diligence process and the timeline for a deal. Uh, I mean, John, you mentioned in some cases you are first introduced to somebody and it may be 18 or 24 months before you actually invest. But let's say at, at the time that you say, all right, this is a serious possibility for us. Is it more like a traditional VC in terms of the process timing or are there are things different because of what you're working with? Let me, let me make, say a word about that. In our particular case, and I think it's true for a lot of impact investors, we begin with impact. If there's no, you know, our goal is, uh, is addressing unmet healthcare needs. So if there's no unmet healthcare need, it's not relevant, you know. So we're going to begin with, does a company belong in our portfolio? Is this consistent with our mission and what we're trying to accomplish in the world? So that's, but then secondarily, we get into the nuts and bolts of, is this financially viable? What's it going to take? What are the return prospects? What is the timeline? And, uh, but in the end, they're both important. You know, I do emphasize, we, I would love to make grants, but we're not making grants. We're investing in companies because the only way to help more companies is to get invest in good companies, get returns and put the money back out the door and amplify this process. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the hierarchy. Yeah, at Cancer Fund, we have kind of a unique process uh, that's slightly different than maybe would be typical, but I agree with Rick that it all begins with social impact. But with, with Cancer Fund, we not only have an initial screening committee that defines the impact before we ever get into the numbers, but then if the company progresses through our process, we actually take the time to have that company during the investment process actually engage with our community of advocates and cancer survivors and caregivers. Um, we have uh, a kind of a, a an interview process and a video process and building content around the company. It's called the Lowdown on Cancer that a breast cancer survivor, Ann Lowe, who's a partner in the fund, does. And it gives a chance for us to get a pulse amongst this community that invests with us, that's a part of us, to see, you know, what is the passion around that? Um, is, you know, it's not just something that we think is important as, as part of the fund, but the people who are a part of our ecosystem think is important. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's a unique aspect uh, to what happens at Cancer Fund um, is trying to build that movement of people that are, that are mobilized around addressing that particular issue that occurs in cancer, whatever the nuance may be. Um, both, both Brian and Rick sort of referenced this, but I think it's really important to emphasize um, a point, at least from our perspective. Um, Impact assessment happens in addition to our traditional venture process, not instead of it. Um, we, you know, we are looking at the business plan. We are looking at the science. We're looking at the management team. All the things that uh, any other investor is going to be uh, presumably focused on, we're doing all of those things too. We add in impact on top of that. Not It is not a substitute for anything just because something, you know, from my perspective, just because you're active in children's health does not mean 
I'm going to make an investment. I still need all of those other things there. And I'll try to help you figure out how to get there, but we still need all of those things. It, 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 we, we don't put any of it aside. Terrific. Um, so you come in, you, you all come in through the various funds and organizations, you, know, you, you write the check, you've all talked about um, what, you know, sort of the, the additional value that you're bringing in terms of the, you know, helping with the collaborations and, and your own networks. Do you all also, do you take a board seat in every company like a, a traditional VC would, or um, does it depend on the situation? Depends a little on the situation for us, but usually we will, we go early. So we are seed stage investors. Um, you know, we, we like to go early. There's a lot of work to be done. So we will usually at least take an observer seat because, you know, not because we want to be watchdogs, but because we want to be there in the discussions and help out. Right, Rick and Brian. I, I, yeah, I would say that um, our goal is to be a constructive player. And what that means is we look at every situation and say, can we add value here and where? Sometimes it means, you know, getting involved at a board level. Sometimes it doesn't. It just means advising the company. And sometimes it means getting out of the way, actually, huh. and, and helping to just be, to lead, you know, lead from, from the back of the room, so to speak, to help nurture a syndicate and whatever else. But uh, we think a lot about making a difference with whatever we have to bring to the table and also managing our own resources, our own time and energy. And, you know, if we can't make a difference then we shouldn't be in the situation. Interesting, because you, you almost never hear uh, an investor say, uh, you know, that sometimes it's what we can do best is stay out of the way. I mean, that's a very interesting perspective. I, I think it's a little more, I think it's a little more honest <laughs> than you hear it in the Valley, you know? <laughs> no, certainly. So I'm just, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. We've got about eight minutes left. Um, have several more sort of topics we'd like to cover, but just as a reminder to the audience, um, please put into the, Karen, I think it's the chat feature. Uh, if you have any questions that we can then try to try to answer. So um, let's sort of flip and put ourselves now in the, in the, in the shoes of a an entrepreneur, early stage company who might be looking to social impact investors as a as a source, um, what advice would you give them in terms of being able to find, you know, reach out and find you, get your attention, uh, make sure that they are talking to the right potential investors, as so they're not wasting their time and your time. So, just what your know, words of advice might you have for for somebody? Um, okay, I'll start. Um, there, so there are a couple things. One is just uh, starting off in the impact space. One of the most important things that I'll stress with folks is um, make sure you tell your story. The narrative is important. I think um, Brian actually touched on this point at the beginning of the early in the conversation around personal stories and different things. Um, I think it's really important for most of us who are thinking about impact to understand why you're doing this as an entrepreneur. Um, don't jump in and, and, you know, have your first slide in your deck. Tell me about the chemistry. I want to know why you developed this. Why, what, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Um, help me understand that, that story. It's, uh, it's really hard to get noticed, um, with folks who are really trying to solve problems. If you're not explaining why you're doing it and how you're going to solve a, a really important problem. Um, so, uh, I'll just, I'll start with that and let, uh, let my colleagues pick up. Yeah, I, I agree with John. I think leading with the why is critical. If, if an investor who's pitching us hasn't seen some of the work that like Simon Sinek has done um, with uh, leading with the why and the, the, his very first video that he did is a TED talk that now has boosted his books and consulting practice and all that type of stuff uh, around the idea where he compared how Apple computer versus Dell computer explain themselves um, is, is critical. You know, facts tell, stories sell at the end of the day. And, and, and they need to, that human element is critical. I think that's what we're all craving um, in the impact investing space is to feel good about what we're doing. And that's, that's critical. Yeah, and I'm completely in alignment with what Brian and John are saying. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because you know life is, is, is about a lot more than money. 
you know, daylight is burning, as they say, and we all have our contributions to make. So th uh, we have a couple of fast heuristics that we run. First question I always say is, is there a legitimate unmet healthcare need? Okay, should this company come into existence to begin with? And does it belong in our portfolio? Number one. Number two, is the science legitimate? It's validated by a, some sort of third party structure or some you know, academic support so that it's not just, it's something that we can actually rally around and, 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 and make sense to us. And the third, and I'd say most important factor is the, the management team. Because at the end of the day, you're investing in people. This is a people business. And I could say a lot on this subject, I won't, but the root of it is investing in early stage companies is more like investing in a sports team than it is like investing in a real estate project. You know, there's the old saying, real estate, location, location, location. No, this is all about, it's the people, it's the people, it's the people. Who are they? Why are they doing what they're doing? And can they execute? Do, are they well matched to the tasks they're supposed to do? And, you know, is there evidence from their life history and careers that they can actually play in this space and make the difference? Um, I'll also add, and I think, yeah, sort of in terms of accessing, um, you know, we do have, I think, like everybody else here, there's, uh, yeah, we're drinking from the fire hose. It can be a little tough to reach people, but try to do it. We, we're all showing up at things like a resi conference um, where there's great partnering. You know, if, if you're going to reach out and try to get a meeting, um, explain why to me why you're a good fit with my mission. Don't just throw me, you know, where we've got some cool science and throw your, your blanket thing that may or may not affect children's health. Tell me why you're a really good fit for me. Um, I'm, I'm always surprised with such a robust platform like Resi's got here, yet yeah, the number of, of requests for meetings I get that don't talk about children's health. Um, but you, you, you got to read what I do. Um, so when you're targeting an impact investor, you know, whether it's me or anyone else, understand exactly what we're doing. Now I have nuances. It doesn't mean you have to be only children's health. health. I love uh, a good story around, we've got a pediatric indication that's our beachhead market and it's going to launch a massive platform technology, but we're gonna solve an important pediatric problem first. That can be a great thing, which is very different than, yeah, we've got something that'll help kids too. So invest in us. It, it, it understand how I'm trying to solve problems um, in doing that. But we can be reached through this. We probably all have websites that have some mechanism for getting in touch with us. Of course, an introduction is continues to always be the best way because it's harder for people to ignore an introduction. Um, uh, I, I expect we're all on LinkedIn. You know, you can find ways to do that. So I would encourage. I always encourage that just because I. It's harder for me to ignore it. No, that's that's all. That's very very good advice. I think that will serve people well. As we're we got about two minutes left, maybe we can end um, with just uh, if you could each of you could give us a sense, uh, just an overall sense of the the size and stage, the sizes of the deals that you do. Uh, they sound like primarily seed and Series A, but tell us a little bit about that. And also to the point of the collaboration, um, being impact investors, do you find that? Um, you are more often than a traditional VC would be as part of a syndicate, you're part of a group of investors going in, even at the early stage, or are you sort of the sole, the sole investor? So just what is the... Yeah, what in our the, case, we like? look at companies at all stages. Sometimes we, it's, it's, we write the first check-in and sometimes we are, you know, it's much later stage for other strategic reasons. We always, we like syndication, we lead them, we join them, and we want to be part of uh, communities that back companies. Makes a lot. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and we're 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 doing look uh, pre-seed seed sometimes a depending um, and depending which vehicle it can be anywhere from you know checks as small as you sort of say one hundred and fifty thousand to a, you know up to uh, uh, a million bucks. Um, we have been. We like good collaborative syndicates, um, but we have also been in deals where we've been the only investor. So we've got a broad range on that. First and only money in a couple of deals. 
Yeah, I, I think our experience both uh, with Profound Ventures and Cancer Fund has been the same. Uh, Cancer Fund is new, so we're just starting to make our first few investments, but I'm guessing it's going to be somewhat similar. Um, there'll be some situations where we may be first money in and only money in. Um, that'll happen. And uh, But we like the idea of a syndicate. Um, because I think just the nature of impact investing is communal <laughs> and, and it brings together multiple stakeholders and multiple folks. I think it's just the phenotype of the people who are involved in this. No, all that, all, I get, thank you, very, all got very, very interesting. So uh, with that, it's amazing how quickly the hour can go when, uh, you know, you're engaged in some really interesting discussions and, and have such a great group of panelists. So I would like to thank, as we're wrapping up, thank our three panelists. Uh, again, I know how busy everybody is. I know how busy everybody is with the Resi Conference. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, I really hope that the attendees uh, learn something uh, that they can use either short-term or long-term. Um, certainly, I'm not going to put words into the mouths of the panelists, but I would hope that if anybody had a you know, specific follow-up question or wanted to look to them for a potential investment, you know, that reach out, mention that you saw them on the panel, and that will help uh, you know, open, open some time up a little bit from them. Um, and I'd say to all the, the attendees, and we had a really nice crowd, we've lost a couple, but not all that many at this point. But good luck with the Resi Conference. And it's been a great platform for a lot of the companies and investors that I've seen um, over the years. And, and you know, good luck to everybody with, uh, with all your endeavors. And we will hope we'll be seeing each other live, maybe in the fall uh, at, uh, you know, at the next set of conferences. That's it. Thanks, Andy, for Thank facilitating. You. Take care, Thank everybody. Thank you very much, Thank everyone. You. That was a wonderful discussion. And everyone have a great rest of your day.